what up what up good evening happy thursday today is september the 30th 2021 this is reverend deontay carroll host of turn up the volume podcast i'm excited to be here again with you guys for another week i have a good friend a good buddy of mine on here uh he's no stranger to the show uh he's a good friend of mine also preacher i literally watch him every sunday this is my road dog none other than the great the great <laughs> pastor jonathan wade of macedonia baptist church what's up brother what's going on man what's going on <laughs> listen how, how you doing in this covid environment man man i think i'm doing just like everybody is taking it one day at a time man uh, taking it one day at a time <laughs> look i'm glad to have you back on you know the last time you came on the show we talked about can the church survive the pandemic can the church survive COVID? Can it kind of bounce back? And we touched on it briefly, but I want to go a different route now because that was uh, earlier this year because I started the show in January. That was earlier this year. And uh, a lot has happened since you've last been on the show. Um, we have a vaccine. A great deal of churches are open now. Some have gone back, some haven't. Um, and we kind of have a sense and precedences are, or there's precedences or precedents across the country being set in terms of what in-person in person worship services look like because churches across the country are setting their globe. Your church is now open again. Uh, I came to preach for you back in August. You weren't quite open yet. Um, but, you know, you and I have talked and you've let me in on some of the plans and some of the things that you had in mind as a pastor in terms of slowly reopening and what that phase looked like for you. Uh, and so and, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of conversation. I don't know if you follow on social media, but there's a lot of conversations. There's a lot of going back and forth with a lot of churches and people. Who are, I ain't opening up. Well, we are going to open up. Well, uh, uh, you ain't, we ain't wearing no masks. We are wearing masks. And so there's a lot of bickering going back and forth, a lot of politicizing, a lot of uh, disagreements. Um, but I, I want to kind of get, you know, some, some, some insight from you. What was it like during that process in terms of making the decision to go back? And what were some of the things that you were concerned about as a pastor? Because I know some people may want to open back up, but they don't know how. Uh, and so I want to create this space for people to kind of get some insight, you know, in terms of I want to go back to church. I want to reopen the doors of the church, but we don't know how. Is it safe? Is it not safe? As a pastor who's done that, what has it looked like for you? Yeah, no, uh, well, man, thank you for inviting me back again. Uh, definitely uh, appreciate you, man. And uh, I mean, I, next time I invite you, there will be people in the in the building. <laughs> That way you can tear up the pulpit and somebody will join you next time. But uh, listen, listen, I shut off by myself if I had to. But I heard you back there. You was on the side. You was like, go ahead. Hey, man. I love every um, bit of it. Hey, man, I love it, man. But uh, but no, I mean, to, to your question, um, so so for me, the, the, the thing that I always wrestle with, and even now, even as we are open uh, at 50% capacity, is... Uh, what can I live with? What can I sleep with at night? As a as a new pastor, um, I take very seriously the fact that I am a covering. I am an under shepherd for God's people, a, a portion of God's people, and so I take very seriously that um, if God is not pleased with the decisions that I make, um, then then I can't sleep at night. I won't sleep well at night. And so, for me, the question was, okay, God. Um, is it possible to open up safely? That was question number one. So one of the things that I did was I took, I was blessed to have members in my church. And this was hard to do because I'm a new pastor in a new church. So I had to take some time yeah. to ask some questions and trust leadership in my church to direct me to members of my congregation who are actually in the health field. Um, I have some members of my church who are, are actual medical doctors as well as who are nurse practitioners who work in um, social uh, uh, social work? Um, I have one of my deaconess. She actually works with seniors with the Department of, of Baltimore Health, mm -hmm. and so I put those those persons in the room. I brought in a couple of teachers as well. Put them in a room, 
and I pretty much a virtual room and I pretty much asked him, I said, look, do the research for us, right? What are the CDC mandates? What are the local mandates of Maryland as well as the city of Baltimore? And tell me what seems appropriate and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. All right. So we did that back in the summer of we actually I did that we did that last year, twenty twenty, right? Mm -hmm. When everyone thought it was gonna be just a few months. Then yeah, yeah. some twenty twenty one, um, we you know, came back to the drawing board and we pretty much said, Okay, what do we need to do? Uh the governor of Maryland opened us up oh, well, allowed churches to open up at full capacity. Mm -hmm. And so what did we feel comfortable with operating? So what we decided was that we would operate only at fifty percent capacity of our sanctuary space. Mm -hmm. uh, and that um, we would have an entry protocol. So persons have to register on our website. Um, persons have to go through a quick questionnaire when they enter the building through a designated entrance. Um, and then they are assigned seats. If, if uh, assigned seats so they can come in in places where pews have been sectioned off for social mm -hmm. distancing. And of course, mask is uh, uh, required in the facility at all, all times. And so, um, that's that's pretty much you know what what we did, and there are certain decisions that we've made as a congregation as opposed to what the state actually allows. So we could open up at full capacity, but uh, we we've decided to remain at fifty percent capacity until uh, vaccination rollout was a lot better. Um, and then the Delta variant came out, and so we wanted to make sure that people felt comfortable. And I wanted to do it in a way where membership uh, felt comfortable. And leadership felt confident to be able to support the entry protocol, so it wouldn't wear them out as well. So that's kind of that's kind of how we moved in that process. And then, of course, the other side is trying to shift this ministry to hybrid, right? Mm -hmm. To allow for uh, 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 streaming and live streaming on services. That took investment, that took time and strategy to put that together as well. So that's that's kind of the gist of, of how it went down. Let's go back for a little bit. You said something that I think is very key and important that some people probably have missed in terms of what you said. You said that you didn't just make a decision on your own to say, hey, this is what the Lord said to me. That's it. That's all. Right. You said you pull people from different backgrounds who have different expertise, pretty much not just in the field of science, but they work with certain populations and demographics that were a part of your church and you pulled them into the same space to say hey and in, in so many words although i'm the pastor i cannot do this by myself and i think the problem is sometimes some some pastors fall on their own sword and they don't include the people that they had that god has blessed them to have in their midst and with it within their immediate reach to help them make certain decisions to say hey what does this look like on the ground? Should we do it this way? This is where I'm where I'm heading. And so you actually taking that step to involve the team that you had around you, that speaks volumes. And so um cuz cuz some people don't do that. Some people, you know, they have an ego whereas they don't want to include other people. We this is my church. This I'm the pastor and that's it. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so one of the things I, I think that I've learned over the years of, of my limited time as a leader in different spaces and even learning from some leaders across the country and across different industries is mm -hmm. um, is, is that, you know, you really need a team, right? Even Jesus had yeah. a team, right? Yeah, Jesus 12, called bro. 12. He had 12, right? <laughs> so you, you need a team, right? But not only do you need a team, I remember the the. Uh, CEO of UMI, Urban Ministry uh, uh, Institute, uh, he actually told us one time in a leadership conference that it is easier to, to get things done when you hire somebody with the skills who doesn't know Jesus mm. than it is to, to hire somebody who knows Jesus but doesn't have the skill. Mm. He said it's easier to get somebody with the skill to Jesus than it is to find someone who loves Jesus but doesn't have the skills that you need to execute a particular goal or mission. And so one of the things is that some pastors, they might have a, a strong team, right? They might right. have dedicated members who love the church and want to serve the church well and, and support the pastor's vision and mission, but they don't have the skill set. Mm -hmm. and, and my approach has been that at least within the realm of personnel that we can reach and, and that I can reach personally, 
who have the skills, who can answer the questions about virology, yeah. right? I don't have, you know, I don't have, who, who can be my personal Dr. Fauci? <laughs> right? and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just blessed that there were members in my congregation yeah. who worked in the medical field or worked in the medical industry um, and all worked in even public school system that could inform us about how we could do this well and how we could do this right. Yeah, and it, and it shows also, um, as a leader, you have balance. You had faith, but there was that balance of trusting science as well. So talk, So tell me about that. Why is it important to also trust? Like, I know we have faith, right? We believe in Jesus Christ, all the other stuff. But why is it important also to consider the science? Not just because Fauci says so, but, you know, and not just because of common sense, but help us to understand or help people that might not even understand why. You know, because some people are so spiritually heavily minded to where they know earthly good. Or oh, as long as I got my faith, that's it. As long as I got Jesus, that's it. But what about the realities of the everyday life? You know, so, what about that part? Well, I, well, I don't, uh, you know, my particular theological perspective is that I don't see a dichotomy between science and faith. Okay. Right. Uh, science is the enterprise of using human faculty to uh, to describe the phenomenon that we see around us, mm -hmm. right? That's, a, you know, you know, science is what's happening around us and how can we observe it as a way of being able to understand why things happen the way they happen, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, science is another mechanism, another tool that even God can use. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's, it's the same way uh, so I'll put it to you this way. I don't have to spiritualize mm. a virus when mm. we spent the last 150 years using science yeah. to understand what a virus is. Right. So I'm not going to retreat back into a closed mind religiosity that's right. devoid of what we've been doing for the last 100 years. And that science has been informing our faith. Right. What you know, you know, us going to divinity school—that's science. That's science, where we pull back the historical, anthropological, social, so, sociological here. areas mm -hmm. of the Bible. That is science, mm -hmm. right? To 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 look at the scrolls of Quran and and to use that and to study the authenticity of the sacred text as close to the original. That's science. We're using yeah. science to inform our faith every day, and so for me, it's not hard to say, okay. What what did God give us as human beings, our knowledge, our human faculty, our common sense, and how does that inform my decision making? Because my personal opinion is that if we take care of what we can take care of, God will take care of God's part. Yeah. And so and so that's important because I'm not a mechanic. Right. I use this metaphor analogy. I'm mm. not a mechanic. Right. Yeah. But if I want work done to my car. I'm going to go to a mechanic who knows about fixing cars. Yeah. I'm going to, me with my curious mind, I'm going to ask, well, what is this tool? Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to pull this part off to get to that part? What is the name of each part? Uh, mm. What exactly is wrong with the car? How can we get to the root of it? How long is it going to take? Right? These are not questions, even though I have degrees and all this other kind of stuff in other areas i'm not a mechanic that can fix a car and so the same thing when we deal with a pandemic as leaders of uh, you know of the church of religious organizations and institutions or what have you right we have to to be able to say hey while i am a spiritual leader i am very intelligent it's not going to take away from my intelligence because i ask a doctor because i ask those who are experts in other fields just like when people have spiritual questions they have to come to us the spiritual leaders who have the degrees and the knowledge and the wherewithal to answer their questions we have to in turn go to people who have uh degrees and in, in, in expertise in other fields and so that's very important um 
that that we do that and that you're taking these steps and that even pastors that are watching they may not have opened up or they may have opened up and may have missed a few steps or, or didn't do things in a more safer way or what have you this is why we're having these conversations because a lot of people are talking about this every day trying to figure out how to open people are commenting i don't know why they opened up i don't know why they opened up their church or i don't know why they they they're not opening up or what have you but have we had a form to where we can have a robust healthy yet edifying and um meaningful conversation about how we should proceed as a church you know um going forward yeah i mean and, and i'll say every every church is different every circumstance is different mm -hmm. um one of the one of the important statistics that even encouraged our decision making was you know the the governor of maryland stated that mm -hmm. you know 80 percent of marylanders had at least one dose mm -hmm. of, of a vaccine right you know that you know that's not necessarily the same statistic in mississippi or texas right and so and so it's sometimes it's locale some churches feel comfortable waiting it out until um until the coast is completely clear and so mm -hmm. every church has to make a decision you know for itself and i think that that's something that at least for me don't criticize other churches for how they're navigating i think what is important is that um I, what is important is is the thing that I remember from Ezekiel 34, mm -hmm. where, where where God talks to the prophet Ezekiel and says that um, that it's the shepherds, the under shepherds, mm -hmm. who have caused my sheep to scatter. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. and and then he says, and this is I'll have shepherds, you know, after my own heart, right? And so mm -hmm. my thing is, as long as pastors are trying to do their due diligence to keep their congregation safe i think that yeah. that is something that's very important that's something that cannot be overlooked and that's one of the things i'll be quite honest with you that's one of the things that i'll every single sunday i always pray and worry about that because if someone um catches covid and it get, comes back that they caught that while in the church that's something that's going to be very hard for me to to navigate and so i make sure that i take every precaution real every precaution just to make sure people are safe and that's a responsibility i have as a, as a as a pastor protect god's people as best you can yeah uh, and so before i switch gears i want to ask mm -hmm. you what because you talked about some of the concerns you had which was why you put all the people in what were some of the concerns of your members mm. yeah uh so some of the concern was um particularly my church is older coming into it and right. so one of the concerns were you know and how are our older members doing, right, in terms of just socialization, right? Mm -hmm. as, as a pastor, I now understand the import of a faith community for older members because the church for older for older persons in a congregation, it is their community center. It is their their lifeline, sometimes to the outside world. Some of my excuse me, some of my members only support our other church members. Mm -hmm. They ain't got no family to rely on. And so um, how do we uh, care for the least of those? And our elders are a part of that conversation. And so um, making sure that they have adequate re resources, uh, you know, can we, how do we navigate Bible study? How do we navigate uh, Sunday school, right? How do we navigate service? What do we say for people who don't have the technology, right? How do we make sure that they stay connected and informed? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other concern was, um, you know, uh, 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 how, how do we protect ourselves um, in the event of COVID outbreaks? You know, how do we make sure that we're as sanitized as possible as a congregation? Mm -hmm. So those were some of the concerns that uh, that some of our members had. Now, so let me ask you this. So is one of the things that you do, do you every week uh, have a company come in to spray or to disinfect, especially now that you have members in, in, in worship? Yeah, so 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 we definitely have uh, well, we have a, a a custodian that comes in, and they definitely come in. They're on a part time basis, but they definitely come in on that Monday after Sunday, and they disinfect our sanctuary, disinfect our bathrooms. We had to install hand, digital hand sanitizers at all the main entrances, um, and uh, on top of that, weekly and day, sometimes daily cleaning. Um, we're contracting with cleaning services to come in and do a deep sanitization. We did it once 
before before we had people come in, we had contract work done on the facility, then we're already planning on having it on a routine basis moving forward. And so and part of it is is that everybody's clamoring for the same resources. So sometimes mm-hmm. it's just the issue of, of of scheduling, trying to get the company to come in and how much does it cost and things of that nature. Well, uh my daddy going my daddy and my bonus mom gonna be happy that I'm doing this. I hope they watch and shout out to my dad, Pastor Robert Johnson and my uh, bonus mom lady. The only lady, as he would say, uh, Lady uh, <laughs> Donna Lynn Johnson, uh, they actually own a cleaning company, Xavier Cleaning Services, where they go all throughout Baltimore service. A lot of churches where they wear the hazmat suits on. So this is a shameless son plug that I'm plugging in for my daddy right now. Okay. <laughs> so they got a, They actually have a, a business where they actually go through. They've done work, I think, for Bishop Brian Martin and some other people up in Baltimore. And, you okay. Know, they, they're right down the street from your church. So I'm yeah. sure they would not okay. mind coming through the to uh, render their services. They wear the hazmat suits and the stuff where they disinfect the air and the equipment and everything in the in the church. So I uh, look them up. Okay. I'll definitely connect you with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk offline. Yes, yeah. sir. And that's for anybody that's watching too. If you're in the Baltimore <laughs> DMV area, look up my daddy and my bonus mom for the cleaning services. Um, so listen, so Pastor, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm in Wesley Theological Seminary wrapping up trying to get my degree, my uh, master's in divinity. Yeah. And one of the courses that I'm taking right now is called Leading Innovation. Mm. And one of the main things that we often talk about a lot is how to be innovative and re-engage the church current slash post-COVID. Because the reality is a lot of um, churches went virtual because of COVID. And so the engagement that people tended to show god or show their respective place of worship has changed right sometimes some people are not as engaged as they were before and i did want to read i had something that i wanted to uh read briefly here Uh, i found a, a, a quote a stat earlier and it said three quarters of u.s adults who normally attend religious services now say they are very or somewhat confident they can do so safely uh but not only that the level of engagement is not as high as it was before and so uh some 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 people who were used to pre-covid coming to church engaging whether paying you know tithe and offering or rendering their services and various auxiliaries and ministries that has kind of come down some right that that number has decreased because people are at home and they're comfortable being at home not having to get up and get dressed to go to church drive burn gas some people are saying, hey, I'm comfortable being at home. You know, I ain't got to go to church because we got it virtually. How do we re-engage people after 18 months of going back to church now that churches are beginning to reopen? Well, I, I, I think so. I think that we have to adjust to the innovation that we've been forced to make. I think we can't assume that if if people have responded so to the to the notion of virtual ministry right i think that that's something that we just have to learn as church leaders to live with mm. you know that you that's know just real. and mm. and and here's the beautiful thing about it is is that you have to allow time to push people to understand the value of corporate worship mm-hmm. right after 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 9 11 everybody was in somebody's church mm-hmm Right. Yeah. And then and so yeah. and, and so what we've experienced as a global community of, of, of people, of human beings, of, of creations of God is traumatic. Mm-hmm. And so we cannot expect people to just be immediately healed, immediately just jumping back into the norm as if they just did not have a traumatic 18, 19 months. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that the question of innovation and re-engagement is twofold. What does engage? We have to redefine what engagement looks like. Yeah. In light of the innovation, right? That 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 even though I only had eighty people in my my Sunday morning service, the the service ends up having three hundred views. So so in my so in my you know and in my churches you know. You know, my church is a modest, medium sized kind of church. Yeah. So, you know, beautiful so, church, by the way. Beautiful so, oh, church, bless you, man. Way. Thank you, man. And so, and, and so, engagement mm-hmm. has to be 
we have to shift what the standard is of engagement based upon the new innovation that we've engaged in. And so you can't base your success off of pews in the seats because that's that's not the standard anymore. Right. It doesn't mean that you're not impactful. It doesn't mean that you're not sustainable. It doesn't mean that you're not um, making an impact. It's just that the the standard of what it means to be engaged is different. Yeah. It's different, right? I mean, no no one questioned no no one questions all these podcasters. No one questions all of these uh, mm-hmm. uh, virtual concerts, and no one questioned the NBA when they spent the whole season virtual, right. whether or not they were engaged with their audience. Right, right, you're right. They they shifted the standard about what it means to be engaging, and so I think we just at the, as the church redefine we it. we have to go back to redefine. We have to reinvent ourselves. That that the mega church model is no longer the model of innovation. That and having yeah. that having mass edifices or or it used to be the thing. It's not the thing no more because times have changed. Right, right. And, the innovation and, and is because, forced to shift. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And so and so we have to really keep that in mind um, as we're trying to navigate life post COVID. And I I don't want to solely say post COVID, but but current and post COVID because we're still in the pandemic, but yet we have to thrive and maneuver and function when this dies down. You know what I'm saying? Um, because the reality is uh, COVID is not going away no time soon. So how do we maneuver and navigate and still function to where we don't lose our presence in our communities and the lives of the people that we service how can we still demonstrate our faith? How can we still demonstrate the power and the love of God and everything that the church has has been called to be, even in a time such as this? And so um, to any pastor or leader who's watching and you're trying to figure out how to reopen or how to maneuver and navigate, I think the bottom line is don't try to measure uh, progress post-COVID with the same standards pre-COVID. But I think I think to your point, I think that the thing that we're kind of dancing around is mm-hmm. how are we defining success? So let's talk about that. How are we defining success? Because that's the whole, you know, that, 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 that because that is driving a lot of people's, you know, a lot of people into doing and making certain decisions. So how do we define success? Well, well, I, I, so so some, a lot of people will argue that success is relative, but I think that that. Um, What's important is to be clear Mm -hmm. in your ministry context what success looks like. Mm -hmm. If if the argument is that success for your ministry is is to have your church packed every single week, Mm -hmm. right, then Mm -hmm. then there has to be a model that you develop during the pandemic as well as post pandemic. Mm-hmm. That does that, and don't get me wrong. I've seen churches online that are packed. Yes, we have. I've like, seen them like too. packed, <laughs> like packed. Hey, listen, right? listen. Before you finish, look. I, we were talking earlier. Uh, I was at Empowerment Temple last Sunday. You know, for a Reverend Turner, his first Sunday. And yeah. you know, you had some people that was. You, I don't know if you've ever been inside Empowerment Temple, but Empowerment Temple is humongous. Like it's very wide. You know, big. And so I was sitting over in the cut by by myself, mask on and everything. I was like, y'all can sit over there. I love y'all. Y'all can sit. And look, I ain't missing or losing nothing because I had some family members in there. One of my cousins that I ain't seen in so long was like, I knew that was you sitting over there, you know. And so it ain't like you can't see me. I'm sitting over there by myself. But, you know, even in a time like that, in a place like that where it's a big place, you have more people than you normally would. You know, and people are coming back, welcoming their new pastor. You still got to practice some kind of safety precautions. Because look here, I, I, was, I was like, I, I was like, look, Rev, I'm here, but I'm sitting over here in the cut somewhere. You know, but go ahead and finish the point. No, I mean, I mean, and so and so, you have to define. You have to define success. Mm-hmm. You, you got to. You have to define success. What? What? And and ultimately, for me, one of the questions that I'm trying to pray about and seek 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 God's face is is God, what is going to make you pleased? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. It, it what it doesn't it doesn't, it, you know, for me, if God is not pleased, even if I have butts in a seat, you know, it's, you know, and so and so for me, trying to define success, what does it mean to be 
successful right now right now where where i am success is can i be consistent Mm. can i be consistent right Mm. now I'm still a young pastor, still trying to form relationship with my church. Right yeah. now, my job is simply to just be consistent. Be consistent. Be I'm not, consistent. I, you know, I, some of my members might say they want to get the church full again. And, you know, some people might ha- want to have a certain number of views on social media. That's, that's fine. They, they, can, they can hold to those standards. But for myself, it's being consistent. Can we deliver yes. every single week and feed whoever is hungry for what Macedonia is offering as a church community. Yes, 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 yes. Those are the right questions that we need to be asking. Um, <laughs> with, with all that's going on, I have some preachers, some leaders have been showing their true colors. Uh, well, before I get to that, let me get to this question in the chat. Uh, so my wife got a question and she in the chat. Uh, she said, so what are your thoughts on people who argue um, you should have the faith to go into the building and return to normal as a demonstration of your faith? That's actually a great seg. See, that's why I married that woman. That's why I married her. <laughs> that's a great segment into 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 what what I was getting ready to go into. So so let, I got a video, Pastor. I, I got a video. This is, uh, you might have heard of him. He's out of Tennessee. Pastor Greg Locke of Mount Juliet. Juliet. Mm. Uh we gonna play this and then we gonna talk about this one. Hold on, just give, give me. We gonna we gonna, we gonna play this one uh, because I thought this was very interesting and it's a good way into our conversation. So let let me let me play this. Pull this in the queue. Look, my wife said. Look, she said. She said. I know. <laughs> 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 so let me play this and then we gonna chat about this one. This gonna kind of answer her question. Segue. All right. Stop it. I know right wing watch watching. I don't care. If they go through round two and you start showing up all these masks and all this nonsense, I'll ask you to leave. I will ask you to leave. I am not playing these Democrat games up in this church. If you want a social distance, go to First Baptist Church, but don't come to this one. I'm done with it. I said I'm done with it. I said I'm done with it. (laughs) That, that... Lord have mercy, Jesus. That's a lot. That that's a lot. Um, and and that kind of segues way into the question that my wife had because you literally have some uh, preachers and pastors who say we got faith. We we serve Jesus over here. We ain't scared. You know, God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So therefore, we got the faith to know that we can congregate in a pandemic and and nothing happened because you also have. Uh, those who use the scriptures, you know, to say that um, uh, you should lay hands on the sick and, you know, they'll recover. You should be able to try it upon surface and, you know, uh, nothing should hurt you and poison and stuff and all that other kind of stuff. So how do we prioritize our faith and common sense and actual concerns? Because you got some people like this gentleman that, that, that function like that. And you have pastors like yourself who are on the side of caution, but yet you still hold on to your faith. So how, how do we figure this out? How, how do we figure so, this out? So, so, so two things to that. So the, the first one is, is, is that I, the, the argue, the, the argument that's being made for the, for the, what I, I'll call just the, the radical faith, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's not consistent. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, okay. You know, you got faith. You can go in, no mask. Well, then the next time you sick, don't don't call nine one one for an ambulance to come and pick up your loved one mm-hmm. who is going to waste a hospital bed for someone who needs it. Right. Right. Or um, if if or if you you know if you got faith, you got faith. Stop taking that. Stop taking your insulin if you got faith. Don't wear your seatbelt if you got faith. Don't use GPS if you got faith. You know, don't you know, don't listen to don't listen to the news to check the weather if you got faith. Mm-hmm. Right. So the the, the 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 issue I have is simply that it's not consistent. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, now, but he answered my second point, which is <laughs> you can find another church. Yeah. You ain't got to you ain't <laughs> you, you ain't got to wear a mask, you know. 
uh, uh, at some churches, but at Macedonia Baptist Church in Baltimore City, I'm, we're going to politely ask you to wear your mask. Um, and, and that's what we have decided as a, as a faith community. And, and I think it's disingenuous. I think it's unfair to make the assumption that because I decide to, to take my health seriously and the health of others seriously, um, that that means that I'm devoid of a, a certain level of, of, of faith. I think that that's, that's not fair. I don't think that's mm -hmm. charitable. And I, and I don't discount people who do believe that. Um, but because I love you as well as I love myself, I'm going to wear the mask. Mm -hmm. I'm with a mask. We are theologians, seminarians, preachers of the gospel who know scripture not just for the char charisma of preaching behind the pulpit, but we actually do our homework and know the historical context of scripture. And so, with that said, Jesus, we both preachers. We, we in the same organization, we're both Baptist preachers, right? Jesus had 12 individuals around him, 12 jokers, 12 different personalities and backgrounds or what have you. Some would argue 12 hell raisers in their own right. I would at least. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Jesus had a doctor around him. And we even see a doctor write some of our scriptures that we love to quote, especially the one where we talk about uh being filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the author of the book of Acts and the book of Luke. Uh, Luke was a doctor. We know that, right? But not only, but not even that. This is not the first time. Follow me where I'm going with this, and I'm gonna preach a little bit if I feel like. It. Uh, this is not the only time that the people of God have seen a pandemic. Mm. 2019, 2020, 2021. Whenever COVID started in Wuhan. 2019-ish, whenever, came over here 2020. We dealing with it right now 2021, got a vaccine, all that other wonderful stuff. This is not the first time that we, as the people of God, have seen a pandemic in our lifetime, but also in so many ways in Scripture. There was a group of people called lepers. Lepers could not live in the same community as everybody else. Lepers, watch this, lepers had to practice social distancing. Historically speaking, they had to stay six feet away. Historically speaking, they were considered, you know where I'm going with this, they were unclean. <laughs> Historically speaking, they 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 were like, uh, they loved the commercial from State Farm, like a good neighbor, stay over there. Right? <laughs> uh, and so it was normal to social distance from lepers because of a health problem that they had when the lepers the 10 lepers went up to jesus the scripture said it never said that he touched them even jesus practiced social distancing because that scripture when them 10 lepers came they came in his presence and he told and he healed them not by a touch but by a word nine of them went away but only one came back to say thank you so I say that to say to my right wing preachers, this is my show, I can say what I want to say, uh, to the right wing preachers with all of this faith, understand the scripture that you preaching from, understand the text that you preaching from, understand the text that you are using to politicize why you don't want to wear a mask, which is your right, whatever you want to do, right? But at the same time, understand that even though we had Jesus Christ, who was our Lord and Savior. Uh, he still functioned and obeyed the laws of the land and did what needed to be done and followed the culture and followed the protocol. Or in other words, he followed the CDC guidelines of his time, even though he was the embodiment of the Savior and he was the embodiment of everything it meant to be uh, the Savior, the Messiah and all that wonderful stuff, even though he died for sickness and he died for leprosy and COVID. But at the same time, when it came to functioning as a human being, Jesus Christ uh, conducted himself according to the law of the land. So I go back to say 
that yeah, this ain't the first time we've seen the pandemic in scripture. We saw leprosy in the Old Testament. We saw it in the New Testament. We saw it when Jesus was here. We even we even see uh, physicians. Uh, Luke, like I said, Luke wrote Luke, and he also wrote Acts though, for the old saints, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, five baptized. I got Jesus on my side and nothing on my mind. Uh, please understand with all that Holy Ghost, the very person who wrote the book of Acts. My brothers and sisters who are holy and sanctified understand that that was a physician, a physician who wrote that book. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm 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 in the Epistle of James, right? Faith without on, works man. is dead. You know, my let's, you know, let's, I, let's deal I with have, that. Let's deal I with have, that. I have I have faith, and my work is this mass. My work is stay <laughs> six feet over there. My work is, you know, social distance. My work is we're gonna do a Zoom meeting. My work is. I'm gonna get my vaccine, and I'm gonna get both shots. My, you know, that's 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 the work, right? I and I'm gonna get faith. my booster when it's time to go get right. it. Go ahead. But but the scriptures say, you know, don't test God. I, I don't have Come on. to. Come on. Come I don't. On. I don't have to prove that God can just because God can. Mm -hmm. or, or better yet, I don't have to prove that God will just because God can. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not gonna test. I'm not going to play spiritual roulette with God, yeah. hoping that God will, you know, it, for me, it's another sense of, of being um, reckless, mm -hmm. right? That just because I know God can open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing doesn't mean I burn through all my credit cards. Come on, see, see. You just, just, you know, just be, I'm, 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 you know, on just, toes. Go ahead just with because, it, you know, just because, just because I know the Lord is a healer doesn't mean I should be sleeping around with every woman that I see. Oh, oh. Listen, just be, you, you, I'm, I'm just messing with somebody's so you late can't, night rendezvous. You, I'm just saying, you, you, so so for me, I just I don't want us to be in a place where because we know God can that we should test and tempt God mm -hmm. and see what God going to do. And so we, we shouldn't we shouldn't be in that business. Do our let's do our work and then faith kicks in. I, I did a Bible study last night and the, the topic of discussion or the scripture discussion was the woman with the issue of blood. Mm -hmm. The scriptures say in the gospels that she saw every doctor she could before she got to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do and then then when she gets healed, Jesus says, Your faith has healed you. So does that mean? So does that mean that? The doctor she went to go see implied that she didn't have any faith. No, she just mm -hmm. used everything she had before she went to the master. Yeah, because yeah. some problems, because some problems we could fix ourselves. God ain't got nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. God, God gave us a brain. God gave us mind. God gave us intellect. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we should use it to the glory of God. And God doesn't have to tell you to protect your children. Yeah. You shouldn't be like, well, babies, y'all going out there and y'all just leave them to the wolves. No, you make the investment to protect your children. Yeah. And you don't need God to to send an angel, send the archangel Michael to come down and hash out every bully that your child runs to. No, you go up to the school and you have a conversation yourself with the, the principal and the in the PTA group and everything else. Mm -hmm. That is your that is you working out your faith. Yeah, work it out, uh, you know, and, and, and get it to a place to where it's very clear where you sit. People are clear with who you are and where you sit, you know. And it, I, I think also the thing that really bothers me is how politicized even the church has become and so divided the church. I have never in my lifetime seen, and this is just my opinion, seen the church so divided. I mean, the the arguments and the disagreements have gone to an all new high where it's just like people that you've been cool with for years. This one little it seemed like the last four years when Trump got in office and everything that came after that, the church has been so divided like never before, man. I, well, 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 you know, I, I think I, I think that um I think the the struggle is 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 the fact that one of the things that we've lost as a people as a society mm -hmm. right is we've lost trust in each other mm. right 
you know, I, and I, I think back to, you know, diseases that essentially have been completely eradicated off the face of this country, mm. measles, polio. It was a time when people trusted each other more. And I just think that we're in a place of, of, of deep distrust. We don't trust one another. Mm. We don't trust that we have each other's best interest at heart, at least particularly specifically to this COVID pandemic situation. Mm. Right. The the very argument of, well, you know, some of the arguments against getting a vaccine that I've heard have been, well, why did it, why, you know, how did they come up with a vaccine so quickly? Mm. And I said, I said, it amazes me that when the entire world comes together for one mission, we're surprised that it only takes them nine months to get it done. That's what happens when unification takes place. We mm. saw the result of every country on the planet yeah. was trying to solve the same problem. Yeah. They, there was an article I read in the New York Times, uh, I think it was last year, where Pfizer, because the, the Pfizer vaccine requires to be at sub-zero temperatures, sub temperatures, that they were researching the distribution system of Dippin' Dots ice cream. Because wow. Dippin' Dots ice cream uses nitrogen gas to freeze as it goes mm. across the country. It, Pfizer was studying an ice cream company. Hmm. And so, so, so the, the crisis created us a moment of unity. Mm-hmm. And then the, politiz- the, uh, the politicalization of trying to solve this problem is where we see the splintering. But we have to get to a place where we trust each other. No, we're not going to always agree on everything. That's not, that's something that's never been universal. We, no one's ever a hundred percent agreed on anything, Right. but can, can we agree that this is a problem? Can we agree that these are the solutions that we have at our disposal to help mitigate this problem? Yeah. And can we, and part of the issue of distrust has been so much mis and disinformation that has gone out that has, turn people aside and i argue that that missing disinformation is the same kind of false doctrine that paul and the writers of the epistle talks about mm. that is false doctrine teaches of every side i made a comment about it in my sermon you should not be getting your your vaccine advice from your cousin that got his research or got her research off twitter hey by the way i saw that sermon i loved it go ahead though <laughs> <laughs> you know you shouldn't that that's i mean anybody who was in high school Mm-hmm. Should, should know that a basic research paper is that you get verified sources, right. sources that are in the expertise. And so I think that we have to check places of mis and disinformation so that we can be as informed as possible. Say, look, it, you know, it, it does Pfizer no good to make a vaccine that makes you sick. Mm-hmm. Even if you take it at a, at a, as a self-interest thing, it hurts their bottom line. That doesn't make sense that they would make a virus that makes you sick. That would hurt their business, right? So just being in, uh, informed, I think, is so important. And I think we have to really clamor down on the mis- and disinformation that takes place. And, and to be clear, there's a difference between something making you sick and side effects. There's a big difference. Um, well, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not in the medical field, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a preacher. But but again, my argument was to some people who came to me was you have no problem with the side effects of alcohol when you drink it on Friday night. But Hello. now all but now all of a sudden a vaccine all of a sudden when it makes you tired or makes you potentially makes you fatigued and you might even be sick. But it's 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 understanding why it's doing that and doing the research to understand why it's doing that that mm-hmm. someone has to do. Someone has to do talking to your own medical doctor. You've talked to everybody but your own PC, uh, uh, primary care physician. And and you're just making just value judgments. And I think that that's something that has to be um, talked about more. The, and, you know, we have a long way to go as the church. Uh, the church as a whole, we're trying to figure this out. Some of us are. Some people are not. Some people can care less. Some people are going to sit where they sit with it. And that's it. That's all. And that's... Your prerogative, that's your right, that's your business, that's your, you know, that's what you decide to do. Um, but for those who are wondering, who are trying to figure out how to reopen, maybe you've, you've reopened and you're trying to figure out how to improve your safety measures. You know, this is why we have this kind of forum. This is why we have this kind of space. 
uh, to be able to have these conversations. And for those who have just been scared, say, I ain't doing it. a doggone thing. We ain't opening up jack until it's gone. Understand, then if you're going to do that, then you have to find ways to be innovative to keep ministry going and to keep things going to where souls are still being saved, still being reached, whether it's in church or whether it's virtually or however you want to do it. There are ways to go about doing it. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say, I mean, to, to your point, and, and, and I'm going to say this, this, this probably will get me in trouble, but I, I'm just going to say it. You ain't in trouble by me. Some, you say what some, you say. Come on. Some, some, <laughs> some communities of faith are lazy. Oh, uh-oh. And so because they don't want to do anything differently, mm. because they don't want to make any adjustments, mm. they, they are trying to baptize their laziness. Woo. Say that again. Baptize their laziness. They they they're trying to anoint their laziness and their sloth. Wait, and so preach up in here. I'm I'm you know and so you know because see everybody who's been doing real work has said the same thing. I work I work seems like I've worked harder in this pandemic than I ever have before. Right, because we've had to make adjustments and we've had to do it quickly, mm-hmm. and people who have refused to make adjustments who want to keep the same old, same old, are trying to baptize their laziness, Mm. trying to baptize um, being innovative, whatever innovation might look like in your community of faith. Mm. So they just lazy. They don't they don't want to 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 do the work of setting up parking lot ministry. They don't want to do the work of setting up, setting up podcasts and Zooms and Facebook and YouTube. They don't want to have to do small groups for Bible study as opposed to having a big thing. They don't they want to go right back to how everything was. And so people have tried to justify by baptizing and anointing and trying to preach their laziness to to follow the shift that requires us to, to take place. As you know, at least that's that's one side of it that I think that that it's is undergirding there, and and it really is frustrating because what happens is people are now taking a seat because now you your hoop don't mean nothing because now you got to say something at home. Mm. I'm sitting here. There's no instruments to 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 get me high. There there there's no laying on of hands. To make me feel delivered. Mm, the mechanics there's no, of church. There's, 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 there's no circus. Now all I got is the word in the book. Now say something. Mm. The charisma and can, the mechanics. Can, 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 you, can, you, can, can you feed me through the test tube because I'm sick? Mm. You, can't, you can't feed me the way we've been doing it. You can't put the, the spoon to my mouth. You can't bring the baby to 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 the bosom Mm. you got to find another way to get this nutrition and be and and i think what's so emblematic is right now the people of god the sheep that god has has cared for us Mm. are that it is emblematic of people who are in that hospital bed in the icu yeah who can't breathe on their own can't eat on their own and we got to find a way to feed them and they cannot eat on their own. Mm. That's the condition of the church right now. And if we're not going to do the work of creating whatever device and using whatever resource we have to make sure God's people are fed, make sure God's people know that they're loved, that they're thought about, then we're going to miss a generation of people stuck in trauma and stuck in an ICU bed spiritually. Mm. Doors of the church are now open. (laughs) <laughs> Follow your ushers to bring your time and offering your soul into the word of this man of God right here, uh, because he didn't preach the whole sermon. Listen, I, one of one of my buddies from seminary, her name is Colette Walker. She she like one of the highlight of the day, baptize their laziness, anoint their slothfulness. My God, on today, listen, I agree because that <laughs> that took me out of here. You baptize their laziness. Uh, what? Ooh, that, where my? Where your cash app at? I'm gonna have to try and send you something. <laughs> Where's my phone at? Oh, my phone. My, I'm using my phone for the camera. Look, that that a preach by itself, sir. Listen, listen, listen. This is why 
I know to some people it seems pointless why I would do a show on this topic, but it's necessary because some churches are really struggling. Some churches are doing the most. Some churches ain't doing nothing. Some churches are going back and forth across state lines and across the street, but this church and that church because you don't like how they doing stuff during COVID, and you don't, and, and they don't like how you doing stuff doing. Like it's just too much unnecessary stuff happening, and yeah. we're losing. I would argue we're losing time and ground because we are struggling to get it together, and and if until we learn how to come behind closed doors and have conversations even to say well i ain't really i don't really like how y'all doing it but you know what i'm saying but i still respect you though i ain't going to bash you because you my brother and sister in christ or my sister church or whatever but how can we function to where uh when people look at the church they're not seeing chaos but they're seeing a church trying to maneuver and trying to adjust according to what's happening in the time and so brother i thank you so much for coming on because yeah, listen i know personally i know what you've been doing to reopen churches you know your church in baltimore and the steps and the measures you've taken we've had conversations and what better way than to bring this here so other people can learn and get a feel you know and, and some people are scared to, to get back out there and, and reopen up you know or whatever the case may be but let this conversation be something to help you out to make certain decisions or to get you going or to make you rethink what you've been doing or whatever the case may be uh my brother pastor jonathan wade go ahead any last comments anything you want to say uh to the people <laughs> oh no man man thank you thank you for having me man i i appreciate you thinking of me enough to, to come on here and chop it up absolutely um, um I, i'll just say that that for me the blessing the grace in this has been is that my 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 church, my congregation has been patient enough with me because they know I'm trying. Mm. And I and I think that for, for any ch church leadership that might be listening, people are forgiving as long as they know you're trying. Mm. You, everybody's not going to be able to do the same thing. Everybody's not going to be able to do it the same way. Everybody's not going to have the same capacity. But they will have faith in the God Mm. that they serve because they see their leaders trying to serve. Mm. And and we just got to try. We're not going to we're not going to get it right. It's not going to be perfect. Everybody know that this is not ideal. But we got to try. We got to do our very best and people will honor the fact that we're trying our best at whatever level we try it on. And I think that if we do that even God will honor the obedience and the sacrifice we give at the level we can give it at. Pass it on the way. Look, do me one quick favor. Tell them where they can find you on social media, the address to your church service times. If they want to come in person, what are the protocol? Uh, yeah. Because you can't just walk in these days. You got to register and do that. <laughs> so tell everybody all the information they need if they want to come in the Baltimore area to come see you. Yeah, so uh, Macedonia Baptist Church, our website is mbcbc.org. Um, on our website, there is a link on our website where you can register um, online. Uh, and when you come to the church, there'll be, um, you know, it'll feel, it'll almost be like you're trying to get into some type of VIP club. But don't worry, ain't no, <laughs> ain't no VIP club music in there. But we'll have uh, persons there who will come check you off, take your temperature and then bring you in uh, into the sanctuary. Um, I'm I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, the same hashtag for both. It's uh, John M Wade, the number one, uh, at on IG and Twitter. So that's where they can find me, man. And and what and what's the service time? Service time 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And you can also watch our service on YouTube and Facebook as well. Yeah, make sure you go on YouTube and subscribe. Hit the bell, turn the notification on. That way, anytime they go live, you're going to get your notification on all your devices. Listen, I know how to put the plugs in there and advertise. I got your back, brother. <laughs> and listen, while we advertising, listen, y'all do me a favor, okay? Go on over right now and uh, do me a favor and follow me on all of my social media platforms at Deontay 
J Curl. That's my Twitter. No apostrophe. Uh, follow me on Facebook because I go live on Facebook every week at Deontay J Curl Senior with the apostrophe. You want to also go to YouTube. Listen, follow instructions because I know sometimes we don't like to listen. Go to YouTube. <laughs> type my name in at Deontay Curl. No apostrophe. Look for my logo. You see the logo at the bottom of the flyer right there. Look for that logo. Subscribe to the channel and then hit the bell. When you hit the bell, click all, A-L-L, because when you click all, that means anytime I post a video, post content, you will get the notification on your devices. Lastly, follow me at on Instagram at Deontay Carroll, all one word, no apostrophe. And listen, if this has been a blessing to you, listen, this calls to keep the software running to do different things, drop something in the Zelle at DeontayJCurl at gmail.com or uh, cash app at dollar sign DJ Carol 91 And also, I do want to say, go on and drop something in the cash app because guess what? October 5th, next Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, is a holiday. It's a holiday because it's my birthday. I'm hitting yes, 30. Sir. I am crossing. Oh, Lord, I'm leaving my 20s, going to my 30s. So... <laughs> Uh, if you want to be a blessing for a brother's birthday, please drop something in the cash up. Uh, help yourself and drop something in the cash up and bless a brother for his birthday. Shout out to my wife because she is playing in some stuff. I don't know what she's playing in. I don't like surprises, but I love surprises. And she's playing in some stuff for me. So I'm preparing for that for this weekend. And just all I want to do is be able to see 30. All I want to do is be able to see 30. I've had some classmates that have not seen mm. 30 yet. Uh, one of my classmates, may she rest in peace, Dara Northern. Her name is Cookie. She was she had a life taken a couple of months ago, 29 years old. She didn't mm. get to see 30. And so um, domestic violence. And so uh, mm. I'm just grateful that the Lord is allowing me to be able to see 30. Do I feel like I'm getting old? I feel like, Lord, please don't let me have a midnight crisis. But, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> with, with age comes wisdom if you know how to grow. If you will allow yourself to grow. And so I'm just thankful to be able to be alive. to uh, Just to be able to have this moment. And so the next time y'all will see me. I will be 30 years old. Good God. Mm. God, mercy. God mm. is good. Man you God look good, good brother. I'm trying to do something right. I'm trying to do something right. You know, I, I'm, I'm okay. I ain't seen no gray yet in this beard. So <laughs> uh, we, we all right. We all right right now. The Lord preserve, preserve my youth. Jesus. Yes sir. Jesus. You know, black don't crack. We're going to make sure of that. But uh, <laughs> but listen, there's so much going on. Jonathan Wade, Pastor Jonathan Wade, thank you so much. I can't wait Bless to you, fellowship man. with you guys again. Y'all are one of the best churches on this side of heaven, specifically in Baltimore. The hospitality, the love that y'all give to your guests that come in, it, it is remarkable and phenomenal. I love your people. I love you guys. Continue to stay strong. And to my guests, thank y'all so much for supporting and being a part of this broadcast and this live. It's so much going on. It's so much on our minds. But no matter what, don't let nobody take you to take your voice from you. And whatever you got to say, do me a favor and say it with your chest. All right. Wait, hold on. Let's go and play this theme song. I love y'all. Y'all be good. Be blessed. Turn up the volume. Turn up the volume. Turn up.